The other thing is the use of the word world. So there's times where Jesus talks about the real world and it's beautiful. He just, he's got nothing but glowing remarks about the real world. And then there's the world you made and it's you is not capitalized. And it's kind of right. talking about the ego. ego's ego, right. world. Right. We could say it's the fragmented world, or the world of linear time, or the world of separation. Um, and, of course, the ego doesn't want the mind to release or forgive that its world, because if it forgives the world, the world is used synonymous to the ego. So, when he says, you know, forgive the past and let it go, for it is gone. He's basically saying, forgive the ego and its world, its cosmos, for it is gone. It's, this world was over long ago, he says at one point. He's tying that use of world into time. Like, mm -hmm. He's saying, you know, just it's, it's over long ago, don't try to keep bringing it into the present and tainting the present with the past. Let it go. Give up the past. Now, what I really like is, there's probably no more clear distinction between the two uses of the word world than Lesson 128 and 129. I just mentioned that earlier, Lesson 128 is, the world I see holds nothing I want. Uh, I actually did a, a gathering in Lexington, Kentucky one time from a friend of mine invited me, Mason, he's a, he was a concert violinist in the Lexington Orchestra and everything, and I was giving a talk and I mentioned Lesson 128, World I See Holds Nothing I Want. He went, ah! <laughs> I said, what? He raised his hand. That's when I quit doing the, the workbook lessons. <laughs> I stopped right there. He said, I said, no. Mm -hmm. I told Jesus, no. That's not true. I don't believe that. And that's it. You are out. <laughs> and he stopped in Lesson 128, the world I see holds nothing that I want. And I said, oh, Mason, wow. 129 is just such a great lesson. He said, what was that? <laughs> yeah, he never got to that one. He stopped dead in his tracks on 128. I said, well, Lesson 129 is the world, but beyond this world, is a world I want. He said, oh. <laughs> it's the typical Jesus. Rip the carpet out from under you and bring in all the choir of angels for what you really want. Like, like taking away a knife from a baby. You, you see the baby, the baby's got the big sharp butcher's knife somehow. Very sharp, very big. And the baby's got a grasp on it and the baby's got a smile on its face. <laughs> Why? It's got something. It doesn't even know what, but mine. And it's sparkly and shiny and it's big and it's sharp. And then when the parent comes in and goes, hmm, there's a baby with a big knife. And you, the parent goes over, the baby turns immediately, reflexively, to protect the knife. <laughs> it's got something. It likes it. It's a toy. Good toy. And then and the parent goes in and then tries to carefully, very swiftly and carefully, get a hold of those wrists and those arms to protect the baby, and the baby screams. The baby screams because it's an it's a invasion, it's an attack, it's a violation, it's a toy snatcher in the guise of mom or dead. And the scream bloody murder because you're going in out of a sense of protection, out of a sense of care and safety. And you know, basically, the ego made up its world, and it, of course it made physical and psychological pleasures, it made an alluring aspects of its dream, 
so that the mind would never give it up. In fact, Jesus comes so far as saying, the dreams that you think you like can hold you back as much as those in which the fear is present or is apparent. The dreams that you think you like, huh? Seven billion people, why do you think the percentage of monks and nuns out of those seven billion is so small? People are going, I don't want to be a monk. I don't want to be a nun. Why? Renunciation. Not popular. <coughs> I think a more popular line would be, eat, drink, and be merry, or one day we shall die. It's more of a slogan for the world. Live it up. Go for it. Go for all the goodies of the world. For one, one day we shall die. It's almost resigning and saying, we're going to die anyway, so might as well have a good time before we die. You know? Some of you saw a Woody Allen movie where he actually had, had dancing kind of skeletons in the movie. And the song in the Woody Allen movie with the dancing skeletons was, Enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. <laughs> <laughs> dancing skeletons. You know, it's that. So, so when we start to say the Course talks about the world in a certain way, it, we have to honestly say it talks about the real world, which is synonymous with the happy dream, in a way of, or the forgiven world, in, in a way of, which is saying, you want this, and I'll help you get there. I'll help you reach the happy dream, and I'll help you reach the forgiven world. I'll do that. I'll offer, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to take you right there. But he also says, you can see this world, he's talking about the fragmented world of time and space, without help. Obviously, that's the problem. We're, we're observing the world every day without help. That's why we have the serenity prayer. Look, Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Grant me, help me. As James Brown would say, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> Don't you think that's a little more humble to saying, wow, the way I'm perceiving the world on a daily basis is not really bringing me constant peace and joy and happiness, so maybe I need some help to see another world, to, or to see the world differently, to see the world from a higher perspective, from an enlightened perspective, from a spirit-inspired perspective, and to me, that's that's what's so great about the Course, it just lays it out, and the only reason that Jesus speaks about the linear cosmos and the world in that way, as synonymous with the ego, is because not only the ego, it made that world, but it is that world. We have to pull our mind away from it. We've been addicted to death. We've been attracted to guilt, you know, we've actually been all wound into this deception and he's saying, well, it's time to make a good discernment and say, you, you don't have to deceive yourself any longer, you, you can know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And, and he's taking us in towards that, I call it, healed perception or real world. So, that, those terms, that's just the way Jesus talks about it in there, but he definitely talks about world in two different ways. And admittedly, he seems to talk more about the disparaging of the ego. That's why when people read the Course, one time I was with Grace, Radiant Grace, when we were in uh, Utah there and having our talk, and we talked about affirmations, and I said, oh, it's, they're beautiful, they're wonderful, 
there, she said, well, the Course has a lot of affirmations. I said, it does, and it's got a lot of other stuff in there. He put, puts a lot of things in there that people wouldn't call affirmations, talking about, you know, tears that shine like diamonds and, and rubies, and, and then he starts talking about blood and, and sepulchers and skeletons. He says, you know, you know, it's like painting rosy lips, he says, on a skeleton. Okay, not the most poetic thing you didn't hear Whitman saying that. Uh, or some of these great Rumi never talked about painting rosy lips on a skeleton. Go back to Rumi. It's a little softer. But he's just saying, this ego thing, you don't want it. It's like poison. And you, you may think you can get by with a drop. Just a drop and he's like saying, don't go for that drop. Because it'll, your whole mind will succumb to that poison you go for it. So we really need to, we really need to see that the ego is a death wish. There's a lot of teachings, you know, Freud said there's ego and superego and id, and the ego was the mediating force between id and superego. It was helpful. Helped you survive. Helped you make it okay on planet Earth. He was the mediator. Jesus said, no, no. It's a death wish. I was in Canada one time, when I first met Jason, he was in the audience, and I was giving a talk in Edmonton. And I was only, just started the talk, I was sitting up front, and it's, some of my friends were there, and just making a talk, and I, I was only maybe five or ten minutes in the talk, and the spirit was very disparaging about the world, in those first ten minutes. Then, comedians had hecklers, and the woman in the front row, you have nothing positive to say about the ego. I'm hearing only negative things, she said from the front row, about the ego. She stopped me, raised her hand, stop! Stop this! You can't, not too much negative thing. So I remember I got my glass of water, took a nice long drink. the water down and looked her in the eye and said, the ego wants you dead. <laughs> Jason was there and he, something in him went, whoa. He listened to the whole talk and he was like, whoa. So that's where Jason came on board <laughs> after that particular scenario.